Hey everybody, welcome to the Evoke Bike Podcast. I'm Brendan Hausler. We have a great guest, Petter Vakoc, and you probably know him from his stellar road career. You might actually know him from his gravel racing, and we obviously talk about all of that unpacking, going road to gravel, also mountain biking with Cape Epic, all of his season goals coming up. How do you train for the different disciplines? And then even things like what does he do in the winter, cross training, there's just a myriad of topics, and we put a bunch of show notes below, but all the show notes don't always hit every topic, so I usually listen all the way through and listen afterwards, but find what suits you. Good luck with your training. Petter, thanks so much. We'll be rooting for you this season. Everybody, go crush it. See ya. Thanks so much for sitting down and chatting. I'm super pumped to talk to you, and I kind of dig in from... I've known you a little bit from your previous road days and now you've got obviously big gravel things going on and want to talk about the grand prix and i'm always super curious about training from athletes at your level so super grateful for you to take the time to do this um how are you doing right now where are you at i'm i'm in girona i'm doing really really well it has been amazing here like the weather is incredible even too good for for january i mean it's last couple of days was like like summer and it's it's just so nice the the riding here uh the trails for mountain bike i've done a lot of them now because of the prep for cape epic but mm. also the gravel is is incredible i will do the first race here in uh, yeah less than uh, 10 weeks or uh, 10 days from now oh wow and there's also also always like somebody to to train with either on the road on the gravel mountain bike so it's 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 great place to to spend the winter time so where, are you, if you look in the stable of bikes, where are you leaning these days? Do you, what are you picking first? Yeah, now now it's the mountain bike. The last two weeks, it's also because uh, because my partner for the for the Cape Epic uh, is here. The the whole team, I'll be part of the Kenyan uh, mountain bike marathon team. So so the three other guys uh, that that we will together put the two two teams uh, are here. So I've been riding a lot with them and. Also with other other mountain bikers from from different teams who will be also doing a lot of them the the Cape Epic. So yeah, last two weeks were mainly mountain bike. Uh, before that, I did a lot of riding on the road uh, because I just put like a fresh uh, road tires on my on my gravel bike. And before that, I've I've been here at, since the beginning of of uh, the winter preparation pretty much. And then it was just just gravel. I had only my my gravel bike here for the first two months or so. So. I've only ridden gravel, so it's like always switching. And now, a few more days of of mountain bike before before switching to gravel again to to do the race. And then the mountain bike will be the main main thing again as as I race in Andalusia at the end of February, and uh, uh, two weeks later is the Cape Epic. That's that. It's amazing to see you so pumped about the bike. Like for people that are gonna be listening, maybe not watching, you can see a huge smile on Petter's face as he's just talking about this. It's like you clearly love cycling, which is uh, pretty evident through your history in it. But it's great to see that sometimes road pros aren't as amped when they leave their career. But I guess you kind of you left on different terms. I feel like um, that's something we can talk about. And uh, well, that's awesome. So where do you place Cape Epic? Um, in the rank of like your biggest goal for the 2024 season yeah it's obviously a big goal but for me it's still a, mainly a preparatory race for for the rest of the season mm. uh it's also the fact that uh as it stands now uh most probably i will be racing for kind of like the backup team uh so we'll have two teams and uh i don't know if the the tactics will still change or it might uh, change as the race develops but as it was last year, there was the main team that was trying to win, and then I was riding in kind of the the support team, which uh, probably will be the case again. Mm -hmm. uh, which, on one hand, I would definitely love to to get the shot to to try to win the race or go on the podium, but on the other, I think it's it's pretty good uh, as a preparation for for the rest of the season. And last year, it worked really well to have uh, such a tough uh, yeah race in my legs and. On my road racing pass, I always, uh, I've always tried uh, after doing a Grand Tour and uh, obviously Cape Epic is, is is shorter, but the strain is also huge. It's eight days, but eight days of all out racing, no rest days and no no easy days. So no sitting it's in. a huge, <laughs> huge stress uh, for the body. And 
I, I think I can I can uh, really benefit from it for for the rest rest of the year. So that's kind of the main main reason. But but obviously also like riding well last year, I will have some personal ambition and uh, will be nice to improve on the the seventh place uh, from last year and to get on a podium and some stages and perhaps even a stage win. So. So there will be some some objectives, but it's it's not a huge objective to to win it. And uh, yeah, uh, but but still, I would like to to come in in a decent shape. And and from then on, the 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 gravel racing or like mostly gravel racing season uh, kicks off just just afterwards. That's awesome. So uh, before we di- so I'm I before we dive into all the plans for 2024 after that. Uh, let's do a quick intro for maybe like the three people who don't know who you are. So it's Petter and it's uh, Vakoc. Is that pronounced correctly? Exactly. Yeah. Who I, I could, I would introduce you probably differently than you might. So I'm actually curious. Can you introduce who is Petter? Yeah, I'm uh, currently a gravel and mountain bike rider, formerly a uh, road rider. Uh, I spent Eight years, I guess, in total, racing for Quick Step and Alpecin. So, so on the the highest level, did the Tour de France uh, twice, and uh, yeah, I won some some nice races. Uh, mainly Brabant Sapel, that was definitely my my favorite moments. One of the bigger Belgian races, uh, right between uh, the Flemish and the the Ardennes Classic. So both uh, on cobblestones and with some hills. And a few other you know, nice, uh, nice results, including a stage uh, win at the Tour of Poland, a World Tour uh, race, uh, third place at the European Games. Uh, it's kind of like European Olympics, the small ones. So, so there was also nice, nice moments. So, so plenty of uh, good results on the road. And yeah, I decided uh, kind of a long time ago that that I would like to race only maybe until I'm 30 years old and then look for, for different uh, ways and kind of like first was uh, was eager to try the, the mountain bike racing as, as I grew up racing mountain bike and and wanted to do the Cape Epic at one point. And then I was watching the, the gravel scene in March and I thought like this is kind of what, what suits me because on the road I was always a uh, strong domestic, uh, spending a lot of time uh, pulling uh, the breakaway back on the flat stages for for our sprinters, uh, be it uh, Cavendish, Kittel, or uh, uh, then Jasper Philipson later on, or Tom Tim Merlier. And uh, yeah, I always thrived, also thrived on the very hard races. And one of my favorite races, or maybe the most favorite is Strade Bianchi, which, which is on gravel. And I was like, wow, now it's it's a thing, the gravel racing, and I would like to, to do it. And uh, yeah, in addition to, to racing i really enjoy traveling exploring new new places and and just uh, just riding my bike and kind of the the adventure side so it kind of uh, clicks all together uh, for me now with with uh, the gravel career which uh, yeah still like 2 years ago i was not not uh, sure if it will be just uh, a fun way to spend time or or if i will be a, a pro uh, again which uh, was a bit it's surprised even for me, but but it's so uh, it's kind of the mix that that I really enjoy: uh, heart racing, adventure, and uh, yeah, just some bit bit of technical technical races. Uh, and uh, it's it's a nice nice environment to be to be in. So after you do Cape Epic, uh, what, do you know which lifetime events you're going to do? So if you have to do five out of seven, have you sort of fix that schedule yeah. yet because i'm sure with you know you're going to go back and forth between europe and the u.s mm-hmm. or would you ever consider staying here for the summer oh uh, no i think at the moment i will i'll be coming back and uh, and there pretty much looks like five five trips so the goal is as, as the program stands at the moment will be to do the sea otter then the unbound or uh, then i will I still have to decide uh, if I will go to Crusher in Tusher. That's that's mm-hmm. like a question mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I will I will for sure do do Leadville. So so those th- three are uh, yeah they are sure. And then Big Sugar is is also like the the fourth one. And then 
it will be either Crusher or maybe, uh, yeah, the Red, because at first I thought there will be European Championships. That was the program last year, but but this year it's it's different. So, mm. so this weekend I could I could go, but it's one week before the World Championships. So so it's not ideal uh, with the jet lag. On the other hand, it could be good to to spend time up in altitude in in Colorado. So that's something I I still want to decide if if uh, I will go for that one or or perhaps the the Crusher, maybe even even both. I will I will see how. How the races go, and then maybe do, yeah, plan after after unbound, and then then I will see how the the rest of the season will will develop. Because yeah, as you said, I will I will be also racing in in Europe, and or I at at the moment the the calendar is really really full for me, and I'll probably have to make some choices later on. But I guess until and unbound the the season is is lined up, and then uh, I might reevaluate reevaluate and and see what's next mm. crusher would probably be pretty good for you though because your mountain bike days would be extremely helpful versus the pure gravel guys who can't handle the technical aspect or am i off base on that assumption yeah i think it it could could be be good for me on the other hand it looks like it's a, like a pure climbers race which mm. is not something i i i really really enjoy it also like pretty high in altitude and so there uh, a lot of the guys from the grand prix uh like mm-hmm. most of the top guys they uh, they are based somewhere really high i saw like last year when i did Leadville that all all the nine guys ahead of me they all were based somewhere somewhere high in the in the mountains mm-hmm. so like <laughs> higher than you can you can stay in in Europe pretty much uh, yeah. in any normal normal city. There is not uh, just some uh, yeah alpine villages perhaps or or isolated places. So so that's a bit of a disadvantage. But yeah. I will have to do some quite some altitude training during the the year to be competitive on mm-hmm. on those events. Also the red so uh, it's also in the altitude to lightville it's it's super high and this also kind of race will be for me hard to to succeed so uh, or i guess i can improve on my on my 10th place but it uh, it worked so well for for the remaining of the season spending uh, time so high in the altitude so i definitely want to to do it again and uh, yeah it was brutal but but nice experience in a way <laughs> Is there any of the events that you have circled that you'd like to win out of like this one way more in your head, or are you just trying to strategically plan for the overall? Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to be consistent. I think I can be really competitive on, in all of them. I am really looking forward to, to already the first one to, to see other because uh, before that I will have a lot of time and the, on the mountain bike coming mm-hmm. uh, there after the Cape Epic. So, so I'm, I'm excited about that one. Uh, then obviously Unbound uh, is probably the biggest goal for, for everybody. It's just kind of like it has to be because, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, it's Unbound. That's, 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 that's what's important. That's what, uh, you know, uh, everybody looks at. Uh, and that's what, what uh, yeah, makes the, the biggest biggest change. So, so. I think that kind of naturally it's the it's the biggest goal, uh, and it's kind of also uh, I think a race that can suit me really well. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, I was pretty close this uh, yeah last yeah. season, so <laughs> <laughs> pretty darn so, close, that is for sure. So what? that's yeah, that's obviously a big one. But but then apart from the the lifetime Grand Prix. A huge goal will be the the SBT gravel. I mm-hmm. I loved that race. I had great time and yeah, uh, I definitely I would definitely like to win win that one. That's uh, that's maybe the goal number two. I would say. What do you love so much about SBT? It was just uh, yeah, such a such a fast uh, race, kind of like yeah, perhaps similar to to Strade Bianchi, maybe yeah. not so like. Uh, yeah, the climbs were perhaps not so not so steep, but kind of in the the way it it felt, you know, like kind of like this, what I like, it, uh, was 
kind of imagining that that gravel is before I did like a first gravel race that it would mm-hmm. be like like Strade Bianchi, so like fast race with sections that you can almost do on the, on like a road bike or just like mm-hmm. bit you know uh, wide the tires and Gucci gravel. And you have a lot of yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so but I think it's also like you know it's it's good for me with my with my road racing background and the way we raced last year when we went like really hard from the from the beginning uh, it's it's still pretty high in altitude but coming there from Leadville I didn't suffer from from the altitude that much mm-hmm. and also the the way those like uh, yeah short climbs nothing like super long uh, so so that that really uh, yeah so it suits me well so it's kind of like a road uh, road racing classic i i found it so it was it was it was really nice to to go so so fast so hard and and kind of like reminded me the the road that's another one that is good if you're ever i mean i realize you don't live over here but if you're ever passing through uh in iowa is, is it iowa god these guys are gonna kill me uh it's confusing now but gravel worlds used to be one of the biggest yeah. races here not the world championships but gravel worlds and that's a super fast course really fun 150 miles not at altitude uh they usually have a really good field john borselman who's in the lifetime grand prix uh-huh. he's won a couple times and yes yeah, really good guys that put that one on so if you ever that's an it super muddy last year or something like it might have been and that was or... one of the first years i used to live in tennessee so i would go there and now i'm on the east oh. coast and it's like so i think it's a 20 something hour drive so i was like i talked to those guys i was like oh i want to come out but i'm like it's really far so it's yeah it was muddy last year but usually it's hot and dry so uh-huh. Uh-huh. um i think we're yeah. Yeah, it's like a seven and a half hour race, seven fifteen maybe if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. But and then yeah, uh, so, last so curiosity on the race schedule. So what do you do? What other races do you have planned in Europe that you'll do? Yeah, I've uh, I've planned maybe four or five of the UCI series, mm-hmm. and then a few of the the lifetime uh, oh, no lifetime uh, gravel earth uh, series, which mm-hmm. uh, the first one is actually here in in Girona, uh, Santa Val. It's a bit like a small one, three day stage race um like short storage stages but but uh it will be pretty high level because there are a couple of american guys like staying in in Girona at the moment facing mcelwin and, and cole payton so mm-hmm. I, I think both of them will be racing and then most of the the european river riders will also also come for the first test so so that'll be interesting one and then also in Girona, uh that will be after the the first round of lifetime grand prix and the bwr in in California, the Traca, which is probably the biggest biggest race here in in Europe, or I think there should be about three thousand participants this year, and wow. uh, it's it's two hundred kilometer long course, pretty demanding. But you have also option to do three sixty and five sixty even kilometers, so some like endurance XL. event. But the two hundred is the the most competitive. Three sixty. Also, it's quite uh, quite competitive. I would say there will be also a strong field. But I guess the 200 is the, the, the biggest field. And then it's also uh, FNLD, uh, Gravel Finland. Uh, it's part of the SBT uh, organization from, from Valtteri Bottas' uh, mm. hometown. And uh, that's also a nice, nice race, very, very fast. So I would say similar to, to the S- SBT. And... Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, uh, maybe few few more events uh, and the World uh, Championships and probably the European Championships. Uh, so it will be, I think, maybe maybe twenty five uh, twenty five races in total plus plus the mountain bike races. So uh, so my goal is to have uh, or or the plan at the moment is around uh, forty. 42 maybe uh days of, of racing with those Ooh. couple of uh, stage races so it's quite a lot for for gravel i would say but it it's for a retired guy the, retired guy yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's funny by the way i was like retiring and, and say like i want to stop like road career but i was like kind of like careful so if i have some like other plans i didn't want to make it like completely that i retired but but also on the other hand i was not 
not sure how uh, how much I want to get into the uh the gravel side first. I didn't mm. want to like commit and then right. say it's like Play next year. I was like, I will, I will, you know, no uh kind of uh commitment or big commitment at the beginning. Just uh, just see and where it takes me. Well, you brought up kind of wanting to shift from things when you hit 30 years of age. And I want to congratulate you on your degree that you just were posting on Instagram. That's awesome. Was that, what drove that? Was that always in the back of your mind when you were like racing with quick step thinking, Hey, I'm going back to school or where did that, was that part of this plan that you've had in your head? Uh, it was kind of, I've, I've started the school directly after high school, but only done about two years and then then stopped or year and a half and then I, I moved abroad to to race in in France and then uh, was racing for the for the development team of Quickstep and became pro and but but I still kept kept uh, kept working with uh, yeah uh, some like psychologists uh, who were like telling me you can you can do it you can combine it and you can like keep you know uh, doing something on the side but I also always kind of like afraid it will take the the energy from from the racing and it also felt like daunting that I would finish the the season and I would like to have like off season but I would be already like a couple of weeks late with the school because like the off season would start maybe mid-October but uh It'll be already like week four of school or something. So mm-hmm. instead of like holidays, I would have to catch up on that. Uh, but but I was like, yeah, I was like, maybe I'll do it, maybe not. And then did a lot of like studies, just like without like formal education, like in the field of of business, in the field of of psychology, which which was the kind of the degree that I I pursued. And uh, also in the other areas of, of nutrition or, or, or training in, in general. So I was always like curious. And that was mainly then when, uh, uh, yeah, during the COVID time when uh, like suddenly there was like a lot of free time, no travel for races, no no racing at first. And like the school was, was everything was online. So I was like, mm-hmm. okay, now now is the moment to, to finish it. And uh, so it was kind of like in my head, eventually i would probably like to do it and that was like just a good good opportunity and since i i did already a year and a half i and, and the degree in, in uh czech republic and, and europe generally i think it's it's just uh three years so so i i just had like yeah a year and a half maybe two years uh two years ahead so so then it felt like doable and uh yeah so i just put it on the on the side and 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 kind of like finish the school yeah, in uh, in May last year, but needed to to write the final thesis and uh, and also prepare for the final exams. So so I just left it for the winter because I knew I can uh, I would have more time. But in the in the end, it was a very interesting project because uh, I did the thesis on kind of like a, a research on on the topic of uh, how to build on the success in the sports career on later in 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 future career which uh, like in a different field which was really interesting for me i knew for example i talked to uh, dylan casey a uh, former american pro who used to race on on us postal who then uh, worked at at google at, at yahoo and i was like how how did you do it like racing uh, with uh with lens so one year and then like uh working uh in google like two months after you stop your your road career and and also like uh yeah uh different uh, athletes i i knew or i i found about who pretty much like immediately after stopping their their sports career started uh, their own business or or, or did mm. like a really interesting career in completely new field and and for me it was interesting like how how do you how do you do it and how how did you prepare for it so so that was always my kind of like question what what how do how do you first how you how do you have to prepare for it what is what the process looks like and also what uh pretty much like what what can you what from the abilities and uh the skills that you develop or that you have inherited uh that are necessary for the success as uh as an athlete 
what what uh, best to use uh, and apply in in like completely different career like a mm -hmm. tech industry or like yeah management of uh, some uh, uh, company that yeah has nothing to do with with bikes for example like completely new industry was there any trend in skills that you heard people saying help them be successful in their next career after cycling yeah it was uh like like it was kind of for the fast transition it was important to that they were like confident in the ability that they can when they were like successful in one field they can they can use it in the in their other field and they can build on their like discipline that they know like uh um, how to plan how to like get uh, through some some disappointments and uh keep keep motivation and mm -hmm. and kind of like really like uh be confident they they what's kind of their framework for success mm -hmm. and kind of like imagine ways how they can apply it in the new field and uh yeah when like uh kind of like being in the field or like uh, talking you know uh, being at the job interview or, or even like approaching somebody like really being uh, like confident like yeah this this what i know it's universal and i can apply it there and it was also about kind of like already having some experience like work experience prior to the career or during the career like kind of like trying trying things out and and at least having something in their like uh cv and 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 being uh yeah so not like being having completely like a blank uh, uh cv with okay. just like professional athlete right and that's it and 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 another like important component which was like interesting for me was that they needed to to do it in a field that they really like that they really enjoy because it seems like that the abilities of athletes to to be disciplined to work hard uh, and uh, everything what like uh, yeah makes a good athlete it's really connected to to the love of the of the sport itself and and kind of if if there is missing this if you don't don't have it uh, you you cannot you kind of like lose the ability to to have this uh, willpower and those mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah uh, those skills so they are kind of like uh this is very important uh important thing and it might it, it's best if it's like the activity it can be you know just kind of like you want to be successful and you want you can build on that but uh if you can find something that you're really interested in then you can you can uh, transfer those skills yeah it's really hard to do those vo2 max intervals or really drive yourself when you're not internally motivated and you're you know only here for the palmares or something like that it's not going to be a long lasting career there's so much psychology in this sport that's interesting that you in that thesis there was Sevilla blanc and actually one of your future competitors in the grand prix cole Patton. he was on the podcast and he was talking about the business side of getting sponsors and when he was very candid about when he got dropped from a team and started his own and just learning that business dynamic and how to go introduce yourself to people and talk to people and have this business chat as opposed to just being a bike racer and it was really it was a good good to get their kind of mindset on that because it's not a skill that everybody has in civilia it was just like we just went started going up to everybody and it felt awkward as hell but it's like training. You get used to it and you get better at it. And you hone your pitch and this and that. So um, my last question, what drew you into psychology and business? Is it something you've always been just curious about or was there something that really stuck out about the program? Yeah, I was, I, I, I originally started after the high school, the business school. I was always like interested in, yeah, like studying business. I kind of like wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and start my own company and uh and was really interested also in like finance and and uh yeah uh so that uh, that was like the field that I thought I would I would like to pursue. But then as my as I stopped those studies and as my career progressed or already perhaps when when I was junior rider, I was also always like curious about how to improve the 
the performance. So so I tried to learn as much about as I could about training and uh, yeah, I wanted to have power meter and understand how to how to train with that. But I also wanted to 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 know most about nutrition and how to mm. like best fuel for the races. And uh, and then the third component was uh, yeah was was the psychology. So I was like curious like uh, yeah about the the mind and and started reading pretty early books about uh, first like just like a sport psychology and like motivational books and then later on like. Uh, I got more and more curious about about the psychology uh, in general, and then, yeah, I was uh, I was uh, also working with, with sports psychologists, and and actually one of one of them they he recommend me uh, this this program that that mm. uh, some of the athletes he worked with uh, say hey you can you can study study this it would be perfect for you it's uh, it's it's a psychology but it's it's kind of on like a like a business school it's like psychology of management or or psychology for for managers so for me it was like kind of like perfect because i have done most of the like the business uh, and management subjects already and i could uh, i could use them uh, from the past studies and and i could only yeah study the the psychology courses and and for me it was like a really nice way how to how to combine and and, and uh yeah how, how to how to get a formal education in something that i was like pursuing just from from curiosity and uh yeah then i kind of relented on uh, those like uh advice for that i was getting for for years just uh like it was kind of like you you know about it anyway it would be quite but uh, yeah, it would be good to 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 finish the school and and oh uh, yeah, I'm 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 grateful I've I've done it because it was was really interesting. I still learned a lot and and also like the the, the process itself of uh, yeah, like doing the final final project and yeah, having like a structure throughout the the weeks and uh have something to to focus on was was really really interesting and and satisfying that's i'm actually i'm thinking back now because it's interesting how you went business and then brought in the psychology i did psychology in undergrad and then went back to school for business and then after having done that i've kind of looked back at like oh now i can bring in psychology stuff to this i it's interesting how you had the business interest first i had zero interest in business when i went through college and uh then that you know, completely changed for me probably six or seven years after, but it's just in. Sorry, I just made. Oh, sorry, I, yeah. I just muted myself. Um, when you were talking about looking back and you were a curious athlete, do you remember any of the initial things that you picked up on training that you were learning as you, you know, got your first power meter and you're reading these books? Uh, were there any like breakthroughs that really have stuck with you? Uh, I am not sure about the the break breakthroughs, but I know what stuck for with me was like the the book I I I read. I think it was like training and racing with a power meter. Mm. There was like a table with like the the power uh, values for uh, different like mm -hmm. duration and like what do you need to be like. Uh, category one rider what like uh, domestic pro and international pro and was like the world class value and i was like circling myself where, where i am standing at the moment and i was counting like okay if i gain like 10 more watts and lose two kilos then i will be here and yeah. so i kind of like knew what what butts I, I i need to do and then i was like you know like kind of like uh, yeah obsessed about the the ftp power and and also already like back then, I know that, and and I I still have it now. I hate like when when I write in a, on the on the training and I see like the, the average what's going down or you know when you maybe write in a big group and then uh, you're not Trusting. really like staying in the zone too. It's not when it's not not enough. So so yeah, I was uh, I was yeah, and then then I was always like you know looking for for a way how to how uh, how to set up my my power meter or the the threshold right so mm -hmm. i know which which 
don'ts I'm I'm writing uh, writing at and and always uh, yeah was about uh, hitting the the numbers. Correctly. Did you ever do any of those workouts that were in the back of the book? They had some kitchen sink ones, and uh, there were I was pretty surprised. There were some brutal workouts that Coggin put in there. I don't know if it was him or if it was Hunter, but some were on paper just like four hour blood bath. I'm like this is so hard. <laughs> No, no, I, I didn't, I don't think I did do that. I always just like followed the, yeah, the instruction from, from the coach, but I, I would often like challenge him and ask him like, why we do, do this and why we do, do that. And, and if we, you know, should be doing that, but I don't remember like doing any of those yeah. like brutal, uh, yeah. If, if you still have the book, look back at some of them. It's like, I, I, I actually, I have to find that book and look back at some of those. I remember I was probably in like three years into riding and they were just, they were hard. But, uh, so what you obviously had a coach, uh, you had to have a coach when you're a world tour athlete. Do you still work with a coach? You do everything on your own. Yeah. yeah I still, I still do. Uh, I, at the moment I, I worked with him like really closely. I, mm -hmm. in, uh, the beginning of, of last year, I, I pretty much like coached myself except for like before the cape epic uh, because i was i had quite like a limited time so so he helped me helped me a lot uh and then after that i kind of like coached mostly myself and then yeah after after unbound, unbound i was like okay i will i want to get like really serious about it and and had like a bit more input from him and yes yeah, as then was the the world championships was coming closer and there was kind of like a long period without uh without races and just like a lot of training so since since then i've i've worked with him like very closely but uh yeah i kind of like enjoy having having the guidelines from from a coach and uh but uh in the end, I still like put uh, kind kind of like my input in it, or just like switch mm -hmm. the days around, but or or kind of like switch some of the the uh, the planned trainings. But I kind of like to have the structure that makes mm -hmm. like help me to to know like okay, I'm 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 doing well, what 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 I should be doing, or at like some moments of of doubt uh, or when I don't know if I feel a bit sick, I skip some, some trainings or something. So, so it's nice to, nice to, nice to have. And uh, yeah, I work, uh, I work with, with, with Simon Kessler. He's, he's based in, in US and mm -hmm. Colorado. So it's also, also nice that, uh, yeah, when I come, come for the races in, in US, I, I, I often try to, to visit him and, and spend, uh, spend some time with him and, I worked with him already during the time at Quick Step and, and Alpatine, but then uh, I could only like use his his advice because then then we had to have uh, the main coach from from the team, and there was not much much space to do do my own thing. But now I I really enjoy like having the possibility to to influence the training more and and have more freedom to to discuss it with uh, with Simon. What uh, what kind uh, of efforts and and the training load works well for me and 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 sometimes we we each of us bring some some ideas and and put it together. Mm. So do you feel like it's more collaborative these days as opposed to before in the world tour where you're we you more yeah. told what to do there? Um, that's interesting to yeah. hear because I feel like as you're such a high level athlete, wouldn't the coach want to hear that from you? Or, I mean, I think there's got to be some give and take for someone with your level of expertise in itself being the athlete how how does that sort of shake out do you think yeah it, i think it really depends on on the team and on the on the coach uh, in general in quick step there was more more space uh, to to influence the training or more my coach there was much more open to to my input and i could have more more to say uh at, at alpatine they they tried to to really like strictly oversee see the training and mm. and kind of uh kind of have everybody like uh, adhere like strictly to uh to the training plan and to the to the food plan and i i, I think for for some riders it, it works great for for some less so so for me it was kind of like sometimes difficult to to like perhaps not not respond 
really well to the training or not feel that good, but not being able to to influence it that that much. But yeah, I mean, on the other hand, they uh, they have uh, they have a great great success. So there are definitely a lot of riders that it it works well for. Mm. Wow, I'm so surprised to hear that. That's interesting. So I guess since it's more collaborative now, what what training session do you try to influence? What's your favorite type of training? Like uh, at the moment, I really like uh, as the as the start of the season is is getting closer, and uh, I really enjoy those kind of like long efforts when you do a couple of minutes below the threshold and then like one minute uh, above threshold, and you repeat it for like perhaps twenty minutes, twenty five, mm. or even thirty minutes, which I think is great because. Uh, like on the road, uh, having like 70, 80 race days and a lot of like easier races, you can kind of build the form racing. But now uh, on on the gravel, where you have just like pretty much just one day races and with the mountain bike, you have some, some stage races, but also not that many. I kind of feel like you need to do much more, uh, much more training or more, more efforts and longer efforts because you, you have less uh, less racing intensity. So mm -hmm. in a way, I find like in on on the road, you have very limited uh, space for, for training. You kind of have the winter time and then uh, it's like most about managing the load, like racing and recovering and putting, yeah, maybe if you have busy racing plan, you have maybe four or five like specific sessions of training per, per month. Otherwise, it's just like endurance, maybe some sprints and and racing and and recovering. Whereas now you have you have much more much more space to to train, and yeah, since the uh, yeah, okay, but big is already big big objective. Uh, so so I need to to put more more of those those training. So so I like those and. I think what I don't enjoy, which is always hard, is like VO2 sessions, like three minutes, almost all out, so like three times. So, and usually like two series of these. So, so I'm glad I have, I have Simon who, who writes those for me, because uh, <laughs> if it was up to me, I would never write those for myself. <laughs> that was going to be my next question that I always love to ask people. Like, okay, we got what you like to do. Now what's the most impactful, which might be the VO2 that you're not going to do if you're self-coached, but so I love the details. So when you're doing these over unders, the two minute under, one minute over, or maybe twenty five minutes, are you thirty minutes? You were talking about. Do you do one of those, two of those, three of those? Does it depend on the day? Uh, I, I, you know, I usually would do like like three of them, uh, maybe four of them if I do just fifteen minutes. But it it would be it would be probably like four minutes below and one minute one minute above. Sometimes maybe three minutes. So so it's way more time like below. Okay. Uh, and then yeah, the 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 average is usually then around or perhaps slightly below below the the threshold. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would do like three times twenty minutes. And when it uh, when it's I think like when I went like the hardest station, it's it's uh, three times thirty minutes, which uh, yeah, mm. it's then. And so uh, sometimes harder than, than some races, I would say. That's tough, man. I, whew, you make me feel guilty. I usually, I'm like 60 minutes. That's enough. And now I'm like, damn it, Petter, he's doing 90 minutes. Ah, what's the, okay. So the VOT you kind of talked about, um, when you look at your, you kind of hit on this, but for the mountain bike skills versus gravel. So you're doing these over unders. Do you feel like they're good for both, or what do you see as the difference in training that you need? Like, what would be different if you were going into just gravel if you didn't have Cape Epic? Or and obviously, like skills on the bike are a big component of that. But power wise, or just training stress, how do you see the difference in mountain bike versus gravel, and maybe versus road also, since you're kind of doing it all? Yeah, it it's also like it really depends on which uh which which races you do but uh mm -hmm. on a lot of a lot of mountain bike races i was i was su surprised kind of like uh two years ago like pretty much the whole season of uh, mountain bike marathons that a lot of them felt a little feel a bit more like like a time trial then it's like a more like mm -hmm. constant effort and you 
you kind of go like a threshold or just below threshold uphills and technical downhills and then you you go and it's it's kind of like this one long time trial but there were some some races and and that was something I, I i didn't do really well or didn't didn't enjoy that much and there were more races they were more like similar to to road racing or or, or a lot of like gravel races where you have, have like a let's say like a really fast start and after some selection you go like really high pace so that's in terms of road i would say it's and generally gravel is very similar to like racing in a breakaway on on some like pretty tough tough race so uh when when it's like super hard at the at the beginning and then when there is some like selection and smaller group you go high pace and then you race again in the in the final and it's not like a normal road racing when you just sit on the bunch and the the pace really stops it's it's more like being in the break like just going hard every day uh, the all day and then just like yeah racing uh yeah all out in the in the final but it's 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 a lot uh, a lot like that and i i really enjoy this kind of like uh, more like uh dynamic of uh of going hard and then like going high pace but kind of like sustainable and then then going hard again mm-hmm. uh which uh yeah on the mountain bike i find it's 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 more constant also on uh, on the cape epic it's kind of you don't have those like easier moments you just just go 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 and then once the group is split then then you just keep keep on going and uh uh but i i enjoy most of the the races when you can kind of uh like uh, yeah recover a bit i would say uh so i i think for the mountain bike you need really like the ability to push super high uh, power and you don't that like going way above threshold it's not that super super important maybe you have on some some certain races with with shorter climbs you need the ability to go go hard and, and recover again but generally it's just like pure like diesel in giant when mm-hmm. on on gravel it's it's more like like balance and then maybe on the road uh, generally you 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 need even more those like super high intensive uh, efforts and I, I would say like on on mountain bike and, and gravel it's not like on most races it's not super important to have like high 60 second power or like two minute power like uh, and uh you know it's it's more like much more constant and uh so that's the main difference Mm. yeah there's a lot of good insights in there for people trying because now there's you know i just there's so many different events that people can get into and it's trying to find that right balance and then of course what is the athlete's natural tendency to do well at so that's definitely helpful what do you think is something that you want to improve on this season the most yeah like one one thing uh that would be important for for the lifetime grand prix and like half of the races i guess it's is the performance on altitude so mm. i think that's that's big uh big thing for yeah at least three races uh out of those and yeah i guess for for some uh, or a lot of lot of races it will be also important to uh yeah execute well well the the final and uh i would say it's more like uh it's something i i i was I was pretty good at at road and I, and and they used to on on it uh so it's it's you know how to how to win a sprint from from a small group or how to you know attack attack in the in the final and uh i guess this is uh, this is what will be what will be really important for for races like like unbound that uh, or or there are plenty of other races uh, where there will be most probably like a small group coming into the finish without uh, without much uh, possibility to to attack so so really like be prepared for for those final and and yeah kind of like work with uh, with different uh, scenarios and uh, be more prepared, uh, you know, because I, I guess it will be still the case that 
on many races, uh, it will be those like messy sprints between uh, participants from from shorter distances and <laughs> kind of like <laughs> how to navigate this. So, <laughs> so it's a different type of road furniture from the world tour. It's like oh, human beings in the way. Yeah, that's. Yeah, dicey, some dicey finishes there. So I'm kind of here, like maybe working on what do you think Simon will have you do for those late in the day efforts? Is it, do you foresee that just being maybe doing interval type work or sprint efforts or those nasty three minute VO2 max efforts, five, six hours into a ride? Or what would you maybe see coming on the training calendar to help you improve on that? Yeah, I think actually. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely should like include more more sprint training because that's mm -hmm. something I generally do a lot in the in the winter, but I haven't done uh, much during the during the the season. So so I guess it has it has uh, yeah it can it can have positive impact if it's something that I keep more in because also the thing is when you race on the road uh, and you check the the, the power meter data you have usually doesn't uh, maybe even hundreds of sprints after 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 race because you you sprint uh, mm -hmm. from a corner you uh, mm -hmm. you know you have, you have so many moments when you do sprint uh, or at least like 90 95 percent all out whereas on, on gravel it's usually not not the case you don't uh, don't really uh, do that. You if you have like you know technical race, then on the road, so many sprints, so you kind of like keep this naturally, and I don't think you have to train it that much. But on on the gravel, I kind of like also tend to push big gear, and uh, I might lose it a bit. Then during the the years, I guess this is something I should focus on. It's like uh, to keep uh, keep spinning because. Uh, I always have a tendency to like, uh, yeah, push a big, big gear and and uh, kind of like execute a brute force, and uh, then it might I might be missing that in the in the explosive uh, finishes. So so that's that's uh, yeah that's that's definitely one one thing. And uh, yeah, I'm curious how it will go now with with the performance and in, in in epic because the the build up has been pretty good so far and uh, mm. I think the the engine should be should be ready for those kind of like hard constant constant effort and later in the season it will be mainly about those yeah uh explosive explosive power and uh yeah perhaps perhaps I might you know uh include a bit more of this like road simulation or maybe even like road races i've have some some road races uh, let's go man we got, we'll hit you up with the road calendar here while you're in the states come out people are like oh damn petters here that's uh no it will be it will be the the levis fondo i will be doing before okay. before the sea otter so uh, that will be quite quite hilly one i would like to do the the national championships on the road and perhaps a few few smaller races in in czech republic and so uh, i have I a see. I have a very, so I'm not trying to bring up a sore subject, but there's, I just am very curious about this when I was looking through your results. So how is it that this Elkov team always wins the national road race? Is it just, they have the most guys in this race? Like 20, uh, I could be wrong, but 2018 to no, 2022, no. a constant yeah, yeah. one it, every they, single they, year. They, they they have pretty good like Conti team. Uh, okay. First of all, they're usually really high on the on the rankings among the Conti teams among mm. top three, top five. I would say they they always so they are solid for 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 a Conti team. They they used to be pro Conti years ago, but now okay. now they're just Conti. And yeah, uh, the national championships always like a big big objective for them. So some of most of the races are riders are on the form, but they also always like have the same tactic like uh, there are maybe 12 of them 14 okay. pretty strong riders yeah so you would have maybe five six other strong guys in the, in the race and the tactic would be just like two guys sit on a wheel of each of the strong guy never take a pull and mm -hmm. just go in a breakaway so like the scenario is always like you have 12 guys going in a breakaway until like there is like a breakaway gone then 
they don't they don't pull so if you if you if you bring it back so it's like very negative racing and yeah. it, it worked for them it was possible to do something about it on some like tough uh circuits or where there was like when i won the world uh, the national championships in 2015 we we had uh yeah we were two riders from from quick step uh okay with martin wells and we had four for guys from the development team who really like uh, worked for me all all day, like all all the five guys, and it was like a tough tough circuit, so we could control the race until the last for the case, and and then we just like uh, I just attacked though, and we we just stayed with strong guys ahead, and the same was the year before when when Zdenek Stibar won the won the race. We, yeah, yeah. We were there two or three from Quick Step. We had another four guys, and 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 we all worked worked for him and. But after that, like kind of like all of there was not this development team, all the strong riders, they were each of them on on a different team. And even though we were like kind of like trying to to ride together, it was uh, you know, it's difficult to to do something against uh, against them, especially when uh, it's kind of like a flatter circuit and you cannot really attack and and get away. Okay, man, I'm embarrassed. I looked, I didn't look back far enough. You did win in 15. I looked on pro cycling stats too. And I was like, God, how did better not win this race? And then I kept seeing all these guys from this Conti team. I'm like, what is going on here? I figured it was probably the negative racing vibe, but all right. So you did, so you want to go back, win that again. And, uh, that's, I remember, uh, Dominique Roland used to have a coach in, Pennsylvania and he would show up mm -hmm. to this local road race every once in a while and it was like I love when people like that show up some people get kind of sour because we're amateurs <laughs> we're like dude what is Dominique doing here but he dragged like 50 dudes around and just exploded everything it was kind of it was, yeah, yeah yeah it's amazing to witness how insanely strong you guys are no we were we were I was like last year I did a race but two years ago I did the race and we were pretty good, like close to do like a good, good result. But there was like, again, like these guys in the breakaway and we started riding and then like, we were really close to them. And then like last lap was, was obvious. We, we cannot, we will not be able to bring them back. And uh, at the, at the time I just, I just told the guys, okay, I'm, I will just like bury, bury myself and, and try to bring it back and give you a chance to win because uh, it was quite quite hilly, not super hard, but but hilly enough. And then uh, there was one of the guys, Jan Hirt. He's now in at Quick Step, mm -hmm. uh, like a Giro stage winner. And he he was one of the guys who helped me to win the title. So I I was kind of like, okay, this this time I will I will just try to to help you. But we just like came short, like ten seconds behind. Wow. And then also what happened, like we 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 didn't catch him, and you know he would he still had like three guys three fresh guys in the in the wheel so i think he finished like four and then i finished like fifth or sixth but uh, <laughs> damn uh, it yeah What's, we tried or you tried give gave a plus effort that counts for something um i'm curious uh, when you were talking about altitude trying to improve on that us uh, and this might be a dumb question i don't know the answer though besides going to altitude and training if that's not really possible, like you were talking about in Europe, being at really high altitude, what else would you maybe do for that? Or would it entail trying to come to the U S and stay at altitude earlier? Are there any like altitude tricks that you have that you would try and use or how would that improve? No, no, I've, I've never tried the, like the altitude stand or now yeah. you have also like a couple of uh, like hotels where you can, go uh and and be like in an altitude uh room but but i kind of like enjoy like going up in the mountains like in italy or 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 france and and uh and stay up there uh but but it's something you can do for uh yeah for two weeks maybe it's not like a place to to live whole year whole year mm -hmm. round and so i would i would i would generally do do that and uh yeah, maybe maybe this time I'll just try to stay a little bit longer. Last year I I stayed in eighteen hundred meters. Which I guess mm -hmm. it's around like six thousand yeah. feet. You can go like to two thousand three hundred, like like a decent place. But uh, so maybe I will I will do that uh, this time. Just try to go as as high as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
but yeah, and then then come as as early as possible to to US. But but I guess from from this point of view, maybe if if I do already in July the the crusher in in Tasher and uh, some altitude camp before that, I get the race on on altitude. I go down a little bit. So, but yeah, and actually at the beginning of summer there will be some some races, some gravel races in the Alps in in Europe. So there's kind of like also can can work uh, as a build up. Actually, what I did last year it was really nice. I I, I rented uh, like a camper van and, and spent one week between the races up, sleeping up in the in the mountain passes. So so it was that was a really nice way of of altitude training. I would say like very gravel like way of, <laughs> yeah. of altitude camp so yeah. so that was fun i definitely want to do it do it again and and yeah perhaps i need need more of of time up up there and uh i guess also uh yeah doing doing more racing up up in the altitude you need to get like with lawrence tendam and he had the camper van over here one winter i don't know if you're friends with him but or not winter one season and yeah, it's very gravel, so that works well. Um, I want to respect your time. Do you have just maybe like fifteen more minutes or so? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, cool. You had um, you had mentioned uh, somewhere else about talking about cross training. It actually might have been when you're on Payson's podcast and doing some schemo back in the day. And I was curious: Are you still big into the winter sports? But also, what about gym? Do you lift at all? Yeah, yeah, I I, I do both. Uh... I really like, uh, yeah, ski mountaineering and cross country skiing. Uh, mm-hmm. That's like the way I would spend uh, the winter in in the past up until pretty much up till I I, I became pro. Then kind of for the first couple of years, I would just like spend the whole winter in Spain or then racing uh, in Australia, Argentina, and uh, like for three or four years, I think I, I never skied because there was no no opportunity for that. And actually, this winter, last winter, I did ski a lot, and and last couple of years, as I lived in in Andorra, so there was the opportunity. I lived in the Pyrenees Mountains and could pretty much like ski just ten minute drive from my home, which which was amazing. But and this this winter being in Girona, I plan to to go often to the Pyrenees for for some ski mountaineering. But there was barely any snow. It was very poor on snow this this winter, so. I've I've only been been a couple of times because the conditions weren't great and yeah regarding the gym I I tried to do a lot of gym in the in the winter in during the season I I never managed to to keep it so so now when the first races will will start I will probably like stop perhaps still have few few sessions in between but uh yeah I really like uh, like the gym and and uh, Last couple of years, I did mainly some like like functional stuff, like uh, just like pretty much free free weights, no no exercise machines, and I, I think it's it it works really well for like performance wise, but but also from from the point of of health because I've done a lot of DEXA scans uh, in the past couple of years, oh. and I've always seen like the the bone density decreasing slightly so that's something i i find like super important so then uh, this winter i did quite a lot of running as well so in Chirona, it's like the running community is amazing and you have mm-hmm. uh nice nice paths for for trail running so so that's the way i like to spice up the training but also to keep myself healthy what kind of lifts do you like to do? Are you deadlifting? Are you squatting? Are you doing yeah. like just lunges or all of the above? What What do you like to do in the gym? Yeah, I like deadlift. It's my most favorite, I would say. Mm-hmm. And some some squatting, uh, lunges, and some some kind of like uh, like snatches or or then more like a warm up, like Turkish get up with with kettlebell or. Mm or some like yeah easier uh, kind of clean and jerk i would i think it's called like kind okay. of easier yeah. like power lifting exercises mm-hmm. yeah, you're like, lifting lifting yeah lower, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he's not playing around i like lower that rates. what's so, so if 
Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. If you like, you definitely believe in lifting if you're doing that type of lifting, but if you don't do it year round, do you feel like you lose some of that strength as the season goes on? Have you ever considered trying to keep it going or is it just too much racing and riding or how do you, could that no, work it's, out? It's, uh, it's, it's, for me, it's impossible to keep it in because then once, yeah, if, if I'm not, not fresh, then, uh, uh, if I have a lot of races, it's it's hard to to yeah do a good quality training in the gym, mm. and then if I skip for, for a couple of weeks, I I'm just That's so sore scary. from from it. So it's I kind of like sometimes had the intention to like keep it, but then uh, it was just like impossible. But but yeah, then then I at least like put in some some core training and stuff to like do yeah to, to keep some some like strength but but not not the explosive one and and mm -hmm. and i just keep it in yeah doing some some sprints but but I, as i mentioned before we might be getting back not, into it we do more road enough, races but, this year <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on simon we got to get those back on the calendar he's gonna come crush everybody uh when these i'm always interested with the especially the longer gravel stuff let's say like five six seven hour um event what are you doing for nutrition are you doing mostly liquid stuff do you like to eat food gels and as people love details so as detailed as you can yeah, give us yeah. no i definitely uh, do most in liquid i i if unless it's like super hot i would use uh this like high high carb uh, mixes uh mm -hmm. so at least like two bottles of like 100 grams per bottle mm -hmm. and then uh, perhaps more like based on on the temperature to keep both like the energy but also the the hydration and then i love the uh the energy gam uh, uh, gummies so mm, okay so you know so yeah, yeah i uh, i uh, yeah i do the uh, with uh with scratch they're they're doing those like really tasty uh gummies so i usually have like a lot of them and then i i would do few gels for the for the final part of the race or for when it's like so intensive that you cannot uh open the package of of gummies <laughs> but but those are my favorite and also kind of like best on my stomach so i i find with uh, when i do most with like liquid plus the gummies uh i never really have uh any any gut issues even like for for like seven hours and and doing uh high amounts of of carbs yeah i've recently like heard now or read about it people start doing uh 120 140 which which is huge and i'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious about it because i'm still at at 90 which i read as a junior already and and have done all my all my uh career and now maybe i'm just a slightly bit bit higher but that was also like interesting for me because already when i was junior i read like you can do 90 grams per hour and i've done it like whole my whole career and like a lot of people they say i used to do like 60 70 but it's like mm -hmm. why i always knew like but it's 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 nuts now do 120 or 140 i i I, I'm curious because I think I've been super high carb. I mean, I have videos about like eat more sugar and I'm 120 to 150 grams, but I think there's going to become a course correction in this because do you know, Tim Podlegar, he's one of the sports scientists for Bora mm -hmm. Hansgrohe and like does a lot of in, in um, individual stuff, research. And we were just talking on a podcast and he doesn't have this study out yet, but he was looking at the difference between 90 and 120 grams. And in the first couple hours, there's no glycogen sparing effect from eating more carbs. So said differently, our body's naturally going to go for the glycogen first. And so it's more important for stage racing, really, when you're looking at like an energy balance, but his big focus was that more carbs later is going to be more effective and that when people were putting too many carbs in mm. in the first two hours it was blunting the ability to use fat as fuel which for me people are probably laughing when they hear me talk about this because i'm so pro carbohydrate but i think all of the talk of we need to train our gut to absorb more carbs i 
I think it's going to shift back towards like a hundred um, or this more staggered start. So he mm-hmm. hasn't put the study out yet. So he doesn't, he couldn't get like fully into all the details, but I think it'll be interesting to see. So you might not be that far off with 90. Um, I would say maybe if you're going to experiment with it, I would do it later in the ride. Cause then. Okay. You, okay. Yeah. It you know, kind of makes sense because also like kind of like naturally I'm training when I, yeah on training i usually don't get it high but like also like how i thought about it you don't eat much in first hour or or two especially when the training is not much intensive and uh when you have like the breakfast uh, an hour or two before the training i i think you still like process some mm-hmm. some of the carbohydrates so so it makes sense to to start feeling a bit bit later right. or or like i was like kind of like curious like okay i had the three hour training and I, I it was intensive but i only did like let's say 50 grams of carbs per per hour but when i had my high carb breakfast like hour hour and a half before the ride i think it's the same like if you had a little bit slower smaller breakfast and you did like 90 grams because yeah it's, mm-hmm. it's in your body and it's being processed so i also it was just i just had this thought like a few few days ago on the ride that if I'm doing like that, it must be so different, like doing like 50 grams per hour on like two hour ride versus on like six hour ride, because like two hour ride, you, you know, you have the breakfast. In. Yeah. It, it, oh man, we could, this could be a whole podcast. Have you ever heard of Vespa? It's uh, just the I, motorbikes. Motorbike. So exactly. The name is confusing, <laughs> I think, but it's from, uh, it means, I forget what it means. There's a meaning behind the name, but it's, I came across this product years ago and I kind of laughed at it because it's all about optimized fat burning. Long story short, because I don't want to bore you with it. I'm 42. So I'm getting beyond that age of, I just, I've had some back problems. I have talked to different people and some people are like, dude, you eat way too much sugar. I don't care if you're this you know, I'm doing 1100 hour years, they're like, you're burning a ton of sugar, and you're clearly working out a lot, but there's still a byproduct coming off of that. So long story short, I come back around to this product. And this guy is telling me, Oh, you could do big days VO2 max intervals on 40 grams of carbs. I'm like, No way, dude. He's like, try this product. And I you go tell me how how it's going. I've been doing sessions that I would do normally 120 grams of carbs on like 50. And the watts are there. It it does actually feel different, uh, which I can't explain yet. I've only probably been using mm-hmm. this for a month, but look up the, it's uh, VespaPower.com. Just, I read about it. It's mm-hmm. really interesting. And I was doing uh, about 900 kJs an hour on this ride and started eating four hours in because I got nervous. I took two of these pouches, was never hungry, didn't feel mm. wonky, weird. I'm like, what the hell is going, what is this product? I'm like, dude, is this, what is this? Is this legal? And it's this wasp extract. There's a bee pollen, but mm-hmm. I find their website interesting because it's so different from what everyone is talking about now. And myself, I mean, I told the guy when he, when we chatted, he was on um, Colby Pierce's podcast. And I was mm-hmm. like, dude, I saw your product years ago and I laughed at it because I'm like, fat burning. That was like the really popular topic. And Team Sky went into all the fat burning. And yeah, yeah. Froome was like joking about going keto. But yeah, I, I'm just amazed that we're s- this far into sports science and we're still figuring out the macronutrients, um, which is exciting though. Like there's going to be breakthroughs yeah. still. So, um, man what's uh you know this was this was amazing i really appreciate you doing this uh again just athletes at your level the amount of experience you have and all the exciting races you have coming up Uh, thank you so much for taking time and sharing all these insights with everybody my last question what's the best way obviously you're on instagram do you blog or tweet or how can people keep up with you this year to follow everything that you've been talking about yeah i'm sharing most of my on my instagram and uh at the moment, I'm at uh, like recreating my my website, just peterwakoch.com. I have, I should have the link on Instagram as well, where my my plan is to to have also a blog and with with the race reports. But I mean, already on Instagram, you you should be informed uh, about everything what's what's going on and and also have some some race reports and uh, calendar and uh, and other plans. Awesome. 
guys, we'll put the link in the show notes. So go give him a follow. Petter, thank you so much. And we'll talk to everybody soon. And